As always, there have been a number of things happening in the world of Palantir. We've got everything from a brand new interview, more NHS commentary, FedStart success, and some new price targets, some of which are quite interesting. Before we get into that though, if you want a place to talk to enthusiastic, like-minded people every single day about Palantir, Tesla, portfolio building, and everything in between, consider joining the Discord. You can get access to that through the Patreon. I'll leave a link in the description below. First up, we've got an interview from Hirsch Jane, who is the head of public health at Palantir. And he speaks at this conference where they discuss the future of healthcare. The second half of that, which I think really is, is gets to the second half of your question, is not just having information in one place so that we can create analytics and dashboards and run models, but actually really so that we can connect it to the decisions and the operations that an organization needs to run. And so that's, you know, the epidemiologists every day at the CDC, the researchers at the NIH, the supply chain experts on the ground at a number of commercial distributors, really having data at their fingertips to make the decisions that they need every day. So that was just a snippet from the interview. If you want to watch the whole thing, I'll leave a link in the description below. I would definitely say it's worth doing so. During this interview, Hirsch speaks about everything that Palantir does, from providing research infrastructure to supply chain forecasting and identifying early on potential supply chain issues even, shortages. But that's not the important part. The important part is not seeing your data. The important part is having the data there organized in a way that actually allows you to then make the best decisions at the best times with that data. And that's what Palantir does so well. Because it's this visibility and having a common operating picture, having all of your data where it needs to be, and then interacting with that data in a way that allows you to be proactive rather than reactive. He also said this, and I think this really summarizes and captures just how valuable Palantir are in the healthcare sector, particularly. We need to get back to the point where clinicians are spending the majority of their time focused on providing care, rather than munging data and filling out forms, and that's where software technology AI needs to go. And so when I think about, you know, the future of healthcare, where Palantir's role is, and all of this, it's helping really provide a centralizing force across this incredibly fragmented ecosystem. And this is why we are seeing Palantir really, really take off and grow in this industry in particular. And it's because the benefits that they provide are really tangible and really important. It's not just a case of helping a business grow their revenue. It's a case of literally freeing up really important people's times so that they can go on and they can save lives or making sure that the supply chain is forecasted in such a way and potential shortages are seen early so that the end user, the patient, isn't suffering. And what he said there about this incredibly fragmented ecosystem really sums it up. And I think that we can see that in the NHS here in the UK as well. In the healthcare sector, for some reason, data just seems to be all over the place. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit everywhere. All in different systems across, in, in terms of the NHS, across many different organizations, different areas of healthcare. And when that data is so fragmented, people can't utilize it to its proper efficiency, what it needs to be able to do. They can't do that. So by Palantir bringing all this data into a centralized source of truth, and then giving the people using the data, the tools and the abilities that they need to interact with that data to pull the best out of it, that's where we really see these life-changing differences. And I really believe that we're gonna to continue to see Palantir scale this and infiltrate the healthcare sector, both in the private area and in the public area. And then only last night, I saw this Palantir X post. So this is coming from Palantir Tech. It says, congratulations to our partners at Calypso AI, on making their security platform available to US government agencies through Palantir's FedStart program. And it wasn't that long ago that we heard about Calypso AI actually partnering with Palantir on their FedStart program. I'll back up a little bit quickly here if you don't know what FedStart is. It's a program that Palantir offer where they basically help non-IL certified businesses fast track their way to working with the US government. In order for companies to supply their software to the US government, they have to have certain accreditations. Getting those is really, really time consuming. On average, it takes 18 months and it's very expensive. On average, again, it costs $1 million. And that's not even the, all of the money that they would need to spend. It's time consuming, it's difficult, and it's expensive. 
Palantir's Fed Start program is really solving that, really helping them get their software to the US government as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So anyway, we heard Calypso AI would join in Palantir's Fed Start program not that long ago. I found an article here from November the 1st. It's only November the 8th right now. So we've gone in the space of just one week hearing that they're joining Palantir's Fed Start program to Palantir announcing that Calypso now have made their platform available to the US government, which to me says that it's past everything that it needs to do. It's in the place now where the US government are actually willing to work with, with Calypso, Calypso AI. So I don't really know what's going on there because on average, it takes 18 months to get the to get everything in place for the software to actually go to the US government. So it's either taken <laughs> it's either taken seven days, which seems very extreme to me, or I'm misunderstanding this, which is always possible, or we didn't hear when uh, Calypso AI and Palantir actually started working together. Maybe we heard that announcement a little bit delayed. As far as I'm aware though, Calypso AI has worked with the US government entities in the past. They've worked with, let me see here, the US Air Force and Department of Homeland Security, but they've still chosen to work with Palantir through their Fed Start program, because like I said, the accreditation process is a lot, lot quicker. It's a lot cheaper. I believe Palantir charged like a one up front fee to do what they need to do. And then on, and then going on from that, they charge a usage based fee. So what I'm hearing there from Palantir is reoccurring SaaS margin fees coming in every single month or however often, which is very exciting being a Palantir investor. But yeah, it makes sense that Calypso AI have gone with Palantir and now they're able to fast track their software in terms of government adoption. So that's really, really cool. We are seeing Fed start scale. In the Q3 earnings, we had two whole slides dedicated to FedStar, which is quite significant considering AIP, Foundry, and everything else that they need to show during these presentation uh, presentations. We are seeing its scale. We saw on, on one of those slides, nine new FedStar partners, which is exciting. And I think this will be a really significant portion of Palantir's business in the future. I don't think it will be anywhere near as big as AIP because the demand there is absolutely insane. But I do think they are really, really solving a problem that a lot of businesses who have software and they want to work with the government are currently experiencing. So we'll have to keep an eye on it and see what happens there with FedStart. But I'm definitely very bullish and very excited to see how that grows. The next piece of Palantir news is actually regarding this NHS Palantir contract. I speak about this a lot. We are still waiting on the announcement of this. We are looking at mid-November now. So maybe in a week, maybe two weeks time, we should have, we should have an answer. But just please don't you know, don't get your hopes up too much for that because time and time again, it has been delayed. Anyway, yesterday, November the 7th, we had King Charles deliver his speech. During this, he addressed both the Houses of Parliament and he outlined the government's legislative agenda for the upcoming season. And just naturally, this did include the NHS. And then we heard during this, David Davies. Now, we saw him um, speak just before the BBC interview where Alex Karp was interviewed by Victoria Derbyshire. Again, I've covered that on the channel, so I won't spend too long. But that, that only happened very recently. And he was speaking about Palantir just before it cut to that interview. He's not really pro Palantir getting this NHS contract. He thinks that there are a lot of issues with a company like that having access and control of the NHS data, which is not really the case. But anyway, let's just listen to what he had to say here. Oh, and thank you to Palantir Chad for sharing the cut version of this. Very, very helpful. In terms of that basis. Now they're doing it again this time because the, the contract's gone out. It looks likely that the, the, country, the company that's gonna win this is a company called Palantir. Those of you who don't know Palantir, it I think started with an investment from the CIA. It's actually largely, its history is in the National Security Agency support uh, in America, and bluntly, it's just the wrong company to put in charge of our uh, precious data resource. Even if it behaved perfectly, if it behaved perfectly, nobody would trust it. And the, the thing that destroyed the last two attempts will destroy this, which is people will not sign up and not join up. So the health service has got to get its act together on this, because if it does, you know, we can do things like have a complete nationwide DNA database. If the privacy is protected, if the privacy is not protected, it won't happen. So there's an opportunity there, and it should grasp it, not drop it, uh, uh, in, in terms of what comes next. At the beginning of that there, 
he said that Palantir are likely winning this contract. Now, I'm not sure if he has any insider information or he's just commenting on the fact that Palantir are deemed as the front runners in this contract, but that was interesting. He then went on to mention the history of Palantir. Quite often, a lot of people that are speaking about the Palantir NHS deal do hone in on Palantir's history and how they have a very spy bad history, I guess. And when people talk about how secretive the company are, what I would say is they've had to be secretive for quite a large portion of the beginning of their life. And that is because they were working with US governments, US government organizations, where the data that they were dealing with and just who they were dealing with was some of the most confidential classified organizations out there. They didn't have a, they didn't have a choice they had to be secretive. They couldn't share what they were doing and how they were doing it. So now they've got a bit of a name for themselves, but I think it's very much based on that. Then, they, then he went on to say, bluntly, just the wrong company to put in charge of our data resource. But he didn't really explain why they're the wrong company. What, what information does he have to say that Palantir are not the right company to be in charge of our data resource? Now, when he says the words in charge, that kind of infers control, someone that is controlling data. And I don't think that's the case with Palantir at all. They're not looking to control data. They're not even looking to access and see the data. They're providing their software for the NHS to then use with, with their own data. They're not really getting involved. And I think that's quite a common piece of misunderstanding that we see here. But just bluntly, the, bluntly the wrong company. Okay, I think people can have that opinion and Maybe some people would definitely like it to be a UK-based company. But I think at the end of the day, we've got to go with what's best for the general public in terms of healthcare and actually better in our NHS. Then he said, even if it behaved perfectly, no one would trust it. I do think that he might have a point here in terms of public trust, public confidence. We are seeing many articles, many interviews, many things come out that are suggesting that Palantir are really not great to be handling UK data. Whether that information is wrong or not, whether people that write that information actually know how Palantir interacts or don't interact with our data is a whole different thing. But that that information is still going out to the public. And the average person won't look at that piece of information and say, okay, well, I'll do my own research. Let me go and find out what Palantir do and how they actually, how their platforms actually work. They'll believe what they see. And because of that, there is a real lack of trust. And previously in the NHS, we've had care.data, which is a program that was rolled out in 2013. I've spoken about it on some previous videos. That rolled out and that ultimately failed just three years after it started. And that was because of the public lack of trust. What I will say is what's being done with the FDP is very different than what was being done with care.data. With care.data, they were sharing it with third parties. I understand that there was a lack of trust. Government, uh, the public didn't have the confidence in that their data was being protected. That's not happening with this FDP deal. But of course, there does seem to be just a misalignment in trust. And ultimately, if the public and even people within the NHS organizations that in, in public and NHS organization people don't like this and cause enough problems if Palantir were actually to be awarded this contract, it could ultimately end up failing. I don't know that. I'm just speculating here, but there does need to be that common ground, doesn't there, for something to be rolled out on this sort of scale and people to be happy and actually want to see the benefits of that. He then went on to say people would not join up and not sign up. Now, as far as I'm aware, if he's, I guess he's referencing Palantir being the supplier of the FDP, the Federated Data Platform. But as far as I'm aware, based on information that I found on the NHS website, people can't opt out of sharing their data with the FDP because that will be literally how the doctors and medical staff see the information that they need about the patient and about treatments and things like that. So it won't be an option. So I'm not really sure what he's speaking about there, but I do agree that there could definitely be public outrage. Let me know what your thoughts on that little snippet that I just shared are in the comments below. So then we get on to some price targets. We have seen since earnings, a lot of different uh, companies and people have been adjusting their price targets for Palantir. But I, fa I found two and they're quite different to each other. So I just thought it'd be quite interesting to go through these. So we've got Bank of America firstly, and they've actually raised their price target from $18 a share to $21 a share for the next year. They did this based on S&P 500 inclusion, which we now know will happen. 
We don't know when though. Uh, AIP momentum. So they are expecting that to continue to grow and more importantly, to be able to continue to grow new customers from AIP demand. And that's still in its infancy. So they're sort of forecasting that out. They're saying that the earnings were really strong, which we know about, we covered on this channel, uh, that Palantir is positioned to help the macro situation, both commercially as businesses start feeling the pressure of needing to integrate AI and ut utilizing AI to better their businesses, and also on the government defense sort of side of their business as well. They can help the macro there. So for these reasons, and we'll go through this in a separate video, I think, because there's a lot to say here. They raised their price target. So now they are saying that $21 per share within the next year, so this time next year, is a fair price to be paying for Palantir stock. If you agree with that, let me know. If you don't, let me know. But then we saw Tyler Radke, I think that's how you say it. He's a Citibank analyst and he has put his price target for Palantir as $10 per share. So that's quite different. We are seeing a, uh, an analyst push the price target up from 18 to 21. And then we're seeing another analyst drop the price target to $10 per share. And at the moment it's trading around 18, $19, that sort of range. So that's quite a significant drop. That's implying that he's thinking that there is a downside risk of about 46%. And here's the article that actually dives into this a little bit. So recent quarterly results prompted their analysts to reiterate a sell rating on the stock. Now there will be people that have sold a lot of Palantir shares since the earnings because those earnings were so strong that it caused a big run up on the stock price and people wanted to take profit off the table. Maybe people were trading this stock around earnings. It makes sense. And you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with actually taking some profit off the table and then maybe putting it back in at a lower price if that's what you wanna do. For me personally, I just can't be bothered to do that. I would rather dollar cost averaging, buy more when there's opportunity to buy more and just hold for the long term. So let's just see here. So the analyst has got a price target of $10 per share, implying a downside risk of 46%, what I just said there. So he said that Palantir's revenue was largely in line with expectations. So he's saying that it didn't go above and beyond, primarily driven by strong commercial performance, which offsets slightly weaker government, uh, government revenue impacted by a government shutdown during the quarter. So he's saying that the commercial side did all right and that made up for some of the weaker government revenue. He also noted, noted that profitability exceeded expectations, but key booking metrics continued to weaken. Despite better AIP momentum and record customer onboarding from new go-to-market strategies and boot camps, the report notes that while the strength of Palantir's US commercial business is significant, the substantial uh, quarter over quarter growth may not be truly operational or sustainable as the third quarter typically experiences the strongest quarter over quarter growth of the year. He then said, we remain on the sidelines as we await further clarification around AIP product and monetization momentum that remain in its early days. He's absolutely right in terms of we have to wait for AIP monetization. That platform is right now not monetized and we don't know when it's gonna happen and we don't know what the monetization of that will actually look like. How much will they charge? Will it be dependent on the business that they're, they're working with? Will it happen next year? Will it happen in 2025? I don't know. But what we do know is that AIP demand is getting really serious. It's really growing. And at some point, Palantir will profit off AIP. We just don't know when. And as an investor for the long term, I'm happy to wait, be patient, I'd like some information about it, don't get me wrong, but I'm happy to wait and just let that happen in its own time when they see fit. They know the inside workings of their business a lot more than I do. And if they think right now they need to concentrate on showing the value so that in the future, and giving it away for free, so that in the future they can just switch that monetization switch on, then I'm okay with that. But I know that a lot of Wall Street analysts don't like that because obviously they're basing their, their targets on the numbers that they have in front of them. So they're not really looking to forecast the potential of a company. They're looking to see what do the numbers tell me? What do the numbers tell me that I can expect to see in the next however many months, however many years? And I think that's what's happening here. But definitely let me know, are you more on the side of Bank of America and you think that the price target should be increased? Or are you more on the side of this Citibank analyst, Tyler, and you actually think that right now the information that we've got, the price shouldn't be where it is? If you want any further information about anything that I discussed in this video and you want me to make a whole separate video on that, also let me know in the comments. I wanna make these videos as valuable and as helpful as I possibly can for the people watching. 
On that note, thank you to everyone who watches my videos, subscribes to the channel, leaves nice comments and just supports. It, it means the world. I say that a lot, but it really does. Thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in another one very soon.